If you've been with us over the last four weeks, you know that we're midstream right now in a study of uh, the Apostle Paul's letter written to a group of churches in, in the uh, province of Galatia. And as we move into part five of this series, I'm excited about what I believe we're gaining through this study. As if we haven't already learned quite a bit concerning New Testament doctrine, this morning we're, we're going to make a transition into Paul's take on the believer's justification that occurs exclusively through one's faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, if you've been with us for the first four parts of this study, then you know that Paul began this letter with some pretty strong, actually very strong and intentional language. You may recall that after that typical Paul greeting, he comes out swinging. Beginning in verse 6 uh, of chapter 1, he writes, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we've already said, so now I say it again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Kind of strong, but, but only two verses later, Paul appears to calm down a little bit, and he writes, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. So while Paul appears to be frustrated, Paul acknowledges that his readers are indeed his brothers and sisters in Christ. He's, he's not saying that they're not saved. He, in fact, he's calling them his brothers and sisters in Christ. And then he, he follows this opening shock and all uh, salvo with some personal testimony explaining his credentials as an apostle is gained through a supernatural encounter with the risen Jesus on the Damascus Road followed by three years of spiritual awakening of some sort occurring in the desert outside the city of Damascus in an area known as Arabia. Paul then points out the acceptance and approval of the gospel he initially brought to Galatia by those who had physically lived and studied under the teaching of the person of Jesus Christ during a three and a half earthly uh, year earthly ministry. And then finally, as we looked at last week, Paul drives home the major points uh, of chapters one and two by examining a case of hypocrisy on the part of Peter who by that time was a well-known and respected leader in the early church. Now, for those who weren't with us last week, Paul details a public confrontation with Peter that many of his readers may have witnessed. What had Peter done that led Paul to do this? Galatians 2, verses 11 through 14, and I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Bible this week, but it tells us that now when Cephas, who is Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him face to face about his conduct there because he stood condemned by his own actions. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat his meals with the Gentiles, but when the men from Jerusalem arrived, he began to withdraw and separate himself from the Gentile believers because he was afraid of those from the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in this hypocrisy, ignoring their knowledge that Jewish and Gentile Christians were united under the new covenant into one faith, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not being straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas in front of everyone, if you, being a Jew, live as you've been living, like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how is it that you are now virtually forcing the Gentiles to live like Jews if they want to eat with you? So in summary, up to the point of today's scripture, after hearing that the believers in Galatia were falling for a false gospel that included elements of adherence to Old Testament, Old Covenant laws, 
A somewhat perturbed Peter wrote a letter condemning anyone who places any level of trust in the human ability to secure salvation. Again, clearly agitated, Paul begins this letter bluntly and then appears to calm down quickly and then present his case to the believers in the same clear and logical manner that Paul is known for. However, as you will soon see, at the beginning of chapter 3, Paul gets revved up again. And he steps back into the ring for round two. Ding, ding. As we move into Galatians chapter 3, I, I want to begin by asking y'all some questions. Have you ever asked yourself any of these questions? How do I know if I'm truly saved? Have you ever had any doubts about your salvation? How do you know that you're living right or that you're right with God? Am I doing the right things? Am I living my life the right way? Have I done enough to please God? And I, I think these questions are likely more common among believers than we'd like to admit. God is a just God, and because we're created in his image, we're all born with a sense of justice. And with that, when something goes wrong, we demand justice. When somebody breaks into our house and, and takes our things, you want to find out who did it so that, that they can be put in jail. When a politician is caught accepting bribes or stealing money, we, we want him or her brought to justice, right? Likewise, when someone directly or indirectly causes the death of someone you love, you want justice served. And in most of these circumstances, some sense of justice is the first landmark on the road to peace. Over the past few weeks, we've repeatedly been using the word justify or, or justification. What is justification? If you look up the word in the dictionary, you'll find a definition that says justification is the action of showing something to be right or reasonable. However, the Bible's use of the word justification refers to the action of declaring or making one righteous in the eyes of a perfect and holy God. Properly understood, rather than a change within the sinner, justification has to do with God's death declaration or what he says about the sinner. So justification per se does not make anyone holy. Instead, it simply declares a person is not guilty before God and therefore the justified are treated as holy. The actual progress towards holiness occurs with sanctification, which is related to justification, but by definition is, is very distinct from it. And with that said, in short firm, uh, form, God's version of justice, or to be justified, is to be declared righteous, or to be made perfectly good. As the original man, Adam was made in the image of God. And since God is perfect, he's a perfect and just God, there is a deep desire within Adam's descendants, which is us, for God's brand of goodness and justice. But who can say that they're perfectly good? Who, who can earn or proclaim this level of righteousness? And I'm going to answer that question for you. No one. Only God can justify you, and you can only be justified through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, Romans 3 you know, gives a very detailed and good explanation of that. It tells us, for everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? 
No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. The scripture that, that I've just read is, is from, is from uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, and it provides us with the essential rhyme, reason, and truth of the gospel. Unfortunately, the Galatian churches had departed from this truth. Those believers in Galatia had believed in Jesus, received the Holy Spirit, and were enjoying their freedom in Christ. Then this group of false teachers known as the Judaizers came to town. Remember that these men from Jerusalem all agreed that it was necessary to believe in Jesus. However, they also claimed that in order for non-Jewish people to be included in the family of God, the men must be circumcised and all must follow the law of Moses. And as a result, the believers in Galatia turned away from the freedom that they'd once experienced through faith in, in Christ, exchanging it for a bondage of obedience to the traditions of their Jewish brothers who hopelessly and mechanically held on to traditions associated with the law of Moses, which is a performance-based measurement of one's ability to follow God and a system that God never intended to be a, a means of justification. Remember that these predominantly Gentile believers never received, fell under, or were ever offered the terms of the Mosaic Covenant. So in essence, they had voluntarily chosen to follow the words of Jewish men, which led them to unfamiliar rites and rituals, most notably circumcision. So Paul begins chapter 3, which is where we're going this morning, by calling the Galatian believers foolish for even entertaining the idea of such a teaching. And then he presents them three separate arguments for why it doesn't make any sense for them to follow any part of the law of Moses. With that in mind, I'm going to use that same approach this morning. First, Paul talks about the Galatians believers, the experience they had coming to Christ. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read the first five verses of chapter 3, which kind of sets the central tone of this morning's message. Uh, beginning in, in uh, verse 1, it says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain if it was really in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? So here we see those smoldering embers that, that had kind of died out in the fire, in Paul's fire that we saw at the beginning of chapter 1. They just caught a breeze and, and they got all caught up again and now the flames of Paul's frustration are kind of burning red hot again. I want to go back to the first slide. Look at what Paul says in verse 1. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? The NIV renders this sentence as who has cast an evil spell on you. But I, I think you'll agree that whatever translation you read it in, that's a pretty strong language. Uh, as I was thinking about this week, it, it reminds me of some days when I got very frustrated with my two boys. And I would ask them a question frequently, who hit you with a stupid stick? There's a lot of different ways you, you can think about this question, but I think what Paul is really asking is, who has sent you off in this direction? Why did you suddenly slam the gear shift and start driving in reverse? And he goes on to say, before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. So not only did the Galatians believers see Christ crucified in Paul's teaching, but after they believed what they heard, they experienced the arrival of the Holy Spirit for themselves. 
We know that throughout the New Testament, we see the Holy Spirit demonstrate God's power in supernatural ways as he comes to dwell in the lives of new believers. So in the New Testament, uh, we see that new believers in Jesus often spoke in tongues or experienced some other supernatural manifestation. That sort of thing had apparently happened to the Galatians. In addition, according to Paul's words in verse 5, they had witnessed miracles through the work of God's Spirit. So Paul asked them directly, Did the Spirit come from God due to your hearing the truth by faith, or did it happen by your doing the work of the law? And since they had, since they had never manifested any Spirit-enabled works before believing in Jesus, the clear answer to that question is that God sent His Spirit in response to their faith. What then do they have to gain by following elements of the law, by following rules? Let's take another look at Paul's line of questioning as found within these first five verses. Again, he says, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? After beginning your salvation by means of the indwelling Holy Spirit, are you now trying to finish it by means of the flesh? And does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your belief or something you heard someone else say? So church, I ask you, <clears throat> what have you heard concerning the Holy Spirit and God's work within you? I'm going to give you a hint uh, for the answer I'm looking for. We've covered this quite frequently in the last year as we often reference early church history in the book of Acts. What is the sign of the new covenant? Anybody know what the sign of the new covenant is? It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. So if we carefully reread the wording in verse 5, let's do that. So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? So a careful reading again of this verse suggests, strongly suggests, that the spirit is still working in these churches. Therefore, Paul is not making a determination or an accusation concerning belief versus unbelief or the presence or absence of the Spirit. That is not his message here. Instead, Paul's point here is finish the new life Jesus has brought you in the same way as you started it. And to that point, this entire issue is shaping up to be an issue of one's faith based on who God is and what he has done. Before we move on, I, I want to point out that these first five verses are very significant to us because they show us that if we're not careful, even believers can slip into a heresy that denies the essential truth of the gospel. So as Paul continues, let, let's examine the second part of the argument he makes. In this next section of Scripture, Paul moves directly into the subject of justification by faith alone, and he's going to take us on a backward journey into the book of Genesis, which serves as an enlightening and powerful reminder for all believers. Let's start uh, this section of today's message by rereading verse 5, and then we're going to add verses 6 through 9. So I ask again, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard. So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. As I've studied this scripture this week, the Spirit showed me what an extremely important section of God's word this is. And with that said, I want to take a few minutes and see if I can help you work through this portion of Paul's argument. 
We already know that the Judaizers are telling people that redemption only begins with believing in Jesus, and then to be truly accepted into God's family, the sons of Abraham, that belief must be followed by physical circumcision and adherence to Mosaic law. And Paul has answered this claim by declaring that the opposite is true. Quoting Genesis, Paul proclaims that Abraham was counted as righteous by believing in the Lord. So who was Abraham and what exactly did Abraham believe? Aside from Moses, no Old Testament character is mentioned more in the New Testament than Abraham. And in fact, the life of Abraham takes up a good portion of Genesis from his first mention in Genesis 11 to his death in Genesis 25. While we know a lot about Abraham's life, we know little about his birth and early life because when we first meet Abraham, he is already 75 years old. In the first three verses of Genesis 12, Abraham's story really gets interesting as we see the call of Abraham by God to leave his country and his people and go to a land that God says he's going to show him. And what really makes Abraham especially unique is that he obeyed God. Genesis 12, 4 records that after God called Abraham, it says he went as the Lord had told him. The author of Hebrews uses Abraham as an example of faith several times. And in Hebrews eleven eight, he refers specifically to this impressive act. It says, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Genesis chapter 15 records an unconditional and unbreakable covenant made by God with Abraham, who was known as Abram at the time. And beginning in Genesis 15, verse 1, we read, Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, Do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you, and your reward will be great. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Since you've given me no children... Eliezer of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. Then the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. So in essence, supported by this and other scripture, Paul's message says that everyone, be it Jew or Gentile, who believes the Lord is a child of Abraham and is therefore included in God's family. Therefore, put in theological as well as practical terms, justification, that is being declared right before God, comes by faith in Christ, period. It is not in any sense or form something earned or produced by following the law of Moses or any other performance-based self-measurement of one's worthiness of eternal life. How can Paul, how can he say such a thing? What about, what about all the requirements of the law in the Old Testament? Paul reminds his readers of, of one of the first things that God said to Abraham. And it's written for all of us to read, and it's found in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. And I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This is how the gospel was announced to Abraham. And Paul makes it clear 
This was God's plan all along. The scriptures always pointed to the day when all people, not just the Israelites who followed the law, would be included in the family of God by faith. And with that, Paul teaches us that the laws or a list of rules or whatever it is were never meant to be the solution to sin. Jesus Christ was the solution to sin. And then Paul goes on to quote scripture in Deuteronomy, Habakkuk, and Leviticus to show that the law actually brings a curse to those who fail to follow it in any way. Beginning in verse 10, he writes, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, as it is written. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of law. That's from Deuteronomy 27, 26. Verse 11 says, Clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. You find that in Habakkuk 2, 4. Verse 12 says, The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says, the person who does these things will live by them. That's Leviticus 18.5. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by coming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. That's from Deuteronomy 21.23. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith, we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So with everything that, that we've learned today, this false gospel presented to the churches in Galatia by the Judaizers has nothing to do with faith. It's about action. And rather than redemption, this so-called gospel brings about a curse. And with that understood, since all people fail to keep the law in some way, Christ had to pay the curse with his own life. And that's how he redeemed those in slavery under the law so that they could be justified by faith in him. And that's how we are redeemed. Finally, in the third part of Paul's presentation, he presents a, a, a very practical legal argument to the Galatian believers. Uh, beginning in verse 15, Paul writes, Brothers and sisters... Let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and two seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, and that's, that's found in Genesis 12, 7, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions and until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. Is the law, therefore, opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But Scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Amen? Covenants are legal documents. And as such, God's unconditional, I'm sorry, His conditional covenant, it was a conditional covenant because it, it was... You know, if you do this, I will bless you. If you do this, I will curse you. So it had conditions, the Mosaic law. As such, God's conditional covenant with Israel, recorded in the law of Moses, did not undo or supersede the promised covenant he made with Abraham. It was a promise. It had no conditions. 
The promises of that original covenant remained in place until the arrival of Jesus, who legally claimed those promises. And as it stands today, all who come to Christ by faith are entitled to share in that inheritance, including non-Jewish people known as Gentiles. That legal transaction gives believers a permanent standing as God's children, whether, whether we be Jewish, Greek, slave, free, male, or female. We are all one in Christ, making us equal heirs to the inheritance God promised Abraham. In the closing verses of chapter 3, Paul puts the butter on the biscuit of what identifies us as a child of God. And we're going to we're going to start at verse 23 and uh, read through uh, chapter 4, verse 7. Beginning in 23, he writes, Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. I want to stop right here and just say that, that uh, in Greek society, a, a male could inherit what their father had, but legally, and, you know, until he became of age, it was as if he didn't have anything. He didn't own it. You know, he, couldn't, he couldn't do what he wanted to. He was under what the Greeks called a guardian. Okay, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I'm saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he is no different from a slave although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the time set had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but God's child, and since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. And with that final word of scripture, that, that concludes our look at chapter 3. You know, for me, this chapter more than reveals the intricate web that's weaved between the Old and New Testaments. And, and that's a web that requires some extended effort to untangle all of it. No doubt, there's a whole lot more that could be said or understood concerning this chapter than I could present to you this morning, if not for the limits of my understanding. But my hope is, is that you'll be encouraged to spend more time in God's word. And as Peter says, let the spirit help you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And with that, I also encourage you to examine your new life in Christ. And should you find that you're placing a, a greater emphasis on performance measurements like tithing or church attendance, or maybe minimizing your use of four-letter words than you've spent on Jesus, you know, take some time to read some of the other New Testament letters like Galatians, like Ephesians or Romans. And then I think through some personal effort, you'll find the true freedom in Christ that will bring you joy in all circumstances as you continue to connect, equip, serve, and encourage others.